Hey guys, it's Bryn with Mama on the Rocks, and we are here with our expert interview, uh, Sydney Peltier, Peltier, I like to say. Um, and we, Sydney's one of our favorites, so she is a she is a not a newcomer to this game. She's been here a while, and we love to have her back all the time. Um, and we're just here for the private extreme parenting community. And so um, today, I think we need to talk about some like. I have been like not even on the struggle bus. The struggle bus has been like upside down in a ditch for about, I don't know, three weeks. And the more that I post about that, the more people are like, holy crap, finally, yes, like we're there too. Um, so I just kind of want to talk about that, about mom burnout and about mindfulness and how can we like maybe slowly but surely dig ourselves out of the gutter um, as we're kind of coming in on a new year. So um, I know about Sydney, but Sydney, why don't you give us, just if somebody is um, new to the group, we've had several new members over the last couple weeks, give us a little intro about you um, and kind of how you relate to the extreme parenting community as well as extreme children. Thank you all for having me on again. Um, and I know that a lot of you see me kind of pop in and out or comment um, on different posts. Um, so I am, have been a therapist for quite a long time and the last five or six years I've been in, um, kind of a group practice setting, um, in Bristol and I mostly see kids and families, um, and couples and, you know, have worked with families and kids for years with um, var varying diagnoses and, and issues. And so I'm very passionate about working with families and being a support and also helping to equip parents um, and being able, you're already the expert on your kiddos, but feeling more and more confident and com comfortable. Um, and also just, you know, helping to create healthy families and healthy parents and healthy kiddos. Yeah, I think I'm a licensed professional counselor <laughs> and a regular play therapist, supervisor, um, you know, among other things. So I almost forgot that. I was going to say one of um, our son sees a therapist in the same practice as Sydney works and he loves to go see Miss Sydney because she has all kinds of like toys and a sandbox and all this stuff in her office and she always gives him candy which she may or may not ask my permission first but it's fine. Uh, <laughs> so tonight we want to talk to the moms. So we talk a lot about parenting our extreme kiddos, about strategies, about discipline and consistency and all that stuff and to be honest, at this point in the like craziest year ever, most of us have pretty much just put all that crap out the window and we're just like in survival mode at this point for ourselves and for our kids. Um, I know a lot of people in this group homeschool, a lot of people send their kids to school, but they're virtual or they're hybrid. And so they, there's a lot more working from home, kids at home. And it's almost like um, in our house, it feels like you can't get away. Like there's no escape. I cannot get away from my husband, who I love, but I love him because we can get away from each other sometimes. I cannot get away from my kids, who I love, but I always say every day, hey, Linda, I'm going to throw you out the window. And so, um, which my four-year-old daughter said to me today, and I died laughing because that's my mother-in-law's name. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, we're, we're visiting them right now. So um, I can't wait till she says that in an inappropriate time. So um, I want to talk with you, Sydney, about just kind of giving us parents some strategies um, and both ideas of some red flags that we can see in ourselves, because I think it's so easy for us to um, like discount and discontinue our own feelings and not even and it's almost like it doesn't register. So I'd love mm -hmm. to know some things that we need to be aware of if we see them happening. And I'd love to talk about mindfulness because that's a practice that is just now kind of um, becoming really popular in education sectors and in counseling that I think is so powerful for kids like ours. And it can be helpful for us as moms as well. Okay, yeah. So I'm notorious for preparing like hours and hours worth of things for like five minutes. So if there are questions and things that come up, you know, please you all comment um, on the Facebook page or, and, and also um, 
in the comments section of where I posted the link today. Um, I put a bunch of different um, resources and also just references of things that I'm going to be talking about a little bit. But, you know, just I start by saying, like, tis the season for burnout and points that is anyway. And, you know, naturally we are in what I call an end season, which has a different kind of set of characteristics anyway, the end of something. Um, it happens to be the end of 2020, which is a whole different kind of ball game. Um, I think that at some point in future, the future, we will refer to um, this year as, you know, the year of which we do not speak. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so I think it's, I haven't seen burnout in folks in, you know, like I've seen it the past few months across the board, all of my clients, um, kids, families, parents, you know, across the board, the last few months, probably for myself personally as a therapist and as a parent, um, and, you know, just with my clients and seeing what they're experiencing, I, I think that it is, it's a whole different level of, of burnout. Um, some, some of the, the red flags for burnout, and, you know, I, I think honestly, we probably feel and experience burnout, whether we call it that or not. We typically know what that's like or what that feels like, even if we don't call it that, um, where we are tapped out at capacity. Um, some of the things that happen when we're experiencing burnout um, is shifted into autopilot, you know, kind of going through the motions, not really feeling a whole lot of emotions one way or the other. Um, big reactions, which is sort of the diff, you know, very different than being a robot on an autopilot, but noticing that our reactions aren't quite matching the situation. Isolation or checking out I call it phone fog, you know, where at the end of the day, like, um, we just sort of check out, aren't really engaged with our kids or with our family. We just mindlessly want to scroll through Facebook or whatever. Um, body aches and pains. You know, we absolutely experience stress and burnout in our bodies. Um, you know, muscle aches, pains, soreness, um, you know, gastrointestinal stuff, even nausea. Um, Self-criticism. I think that in times of high stress and burnout, the, that internal dialogue that we have with ourselves, um, I think tends to shift to, to being more critical of ourselves. Um, I think that typically in seasons like this, instead of slowing down, we tend to strive and push. When we notice that fatigue start to set in and the stress, we don't always honor ourselves in the midst of that. We feel like we've got to step on the gas instead of pumping the brakes. Um, and also this kind of re relates a bit to autopilot, but just a sense of apathy, mm -hmm. like not nothing really, nothing really matters. Yeah. Do you think that as extreme parents, um, and I mean, I know this is true at times for any parent, but because um, the needs of our kids tends to be on most days very, very high, and so we're, we tend to sort of live hypervigilantly, do you think that extreme parents specifically can almost go through this burnout cycle daily? Because some of the stuff you were saying, it's not just like, oh yeah, I made it to the end of the year and I'm exhausted and all these things are true. I feel like I feel that on a Wednesday. Like mm -hmm. this is just my normal life. Is that something that you see or is that, or is that crazy? No, I, I think, um, I mean, I think that's an interesting way to think about it, but I think probably especially as, as extreme parents, you're used to co-regulating with your kids and 
you know, from a good place of trying to be in the moment and figure out what it, what it, what's going to work and manage behaviors. And so it's very easy for us to co-regulate to our kids and allow our kids to set the pace. All, all parents struggle with that, sure. right? Um, we tend to react to their reactions instead of getting, you know, instead of having less of react of a reaction and kind of setting the pace for them and allowing them to um, co-regulate to us. Um, often we just sort of become the bigger kid with the bigger reaction, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I think that um, some of the bur burnout comes from just being so exhausted with trying to help mitigate those yeah. behaviors because obviously they're in a season two where they're, they're also in at the end of 2020. Yeah. Um, and they're trying to manage their internal experience of all the stress. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very difficult for kids and for parents in that sort of way. So absolutely. I think that's totally true. Well, talk to us about mindfulness because um, I am a firm believer in its importance and I really have a hard time with it because I'm a striver chronically. And so I have a hard time just being present, just like slowing my role enough, even if I'm by myself, to just like, <laughs> like pump the brakes and chillax for a minute. Like I, it, that is very difficult for me. It's, it has to be very intentional. And, and I see that in our son too, who's our extreme child of the two. And like, we almost have to have like a warm up to being mindful and then he can be mine. Like it's, it's a process. So talk to us about why is that important and what might that look like? Well, I feel like one of the things, even before we can, um, like you're saying, even before we can approach mindfulness, um, is we really have to understand what's happening in our brains and bodies when we are feeling stress and we're trying to accommodate stress or react to it. And one of the things um, on the videos that I posted for you all about mindfulness from Happify, they're like two or three minute videos and they're so good at just kind of explaining it. And one of the things that she talks about that talks about on there is learning to respond wisely versus reacting blindly. Mm -hmm. And I also posted um, Brene Brown's um, somewhat recent podcast where she's talking um, to um, Emily and Amelia Nagotsky um, about completing the stress response cycle. And that and so book, think, guys, just so you know, that book is on the Mama on the Rocks Facebook page in the shop. It's also in the shop on the mamaontherocks.com. And so you can literally just click through and it'll take you right to the Amazon. It's awesome. So go ahead. And I, I posted the uh, podcast of it too, because the banter is just really good. And it's such a fresh way of understanding that the the stressors, acute stressors, chronic stressors are different than the stress response cycle. And even in the presence of ongoing stressors, it's important to come in and out um, of that experience in completing the stress response cycle. And so, um, you know, mindfulness or similar techniques are one of the ways um, of doing that. Um, in the book and in the podcast, they talk about the top ways to complete the stress cycle. And just to name those really quick for you all, the number one, and these are all based on research. Um, the number one way, um, to do that is through physical activity. Number two is breathing, um, uh, breathing mindfulness activities. Number three is positive social interaction. Number four, laughter. Number five, affection. Number six, um, they, they call it a big old cry, like a cathartic, let it rip tater chip cry. <laughs> um, and seven is creative expression. And so understanding that stress is 
a neurological experience and a physiological experience. One of the things about mindfulness um, and, and understanding stress and the way that we respond to that is when we experience stress or some sort of heightened emotion, that's an affective experience for us. We are emotional beings that occasionally think. What we do though is we often feel at odds with our own experience of how we're feeling or a trigger or stressors. We don't want to, especially if the, any kind of negative emotions, you know, we don't do the same thing with positive emotions. We aren't at odds with ourselves if we feel happy or excited. If we feel sad or guilty or grief, you know, we tend to stiff arm those things. They talk about in the book, thinking about emotions like a tunnel. And when we're at odds with our, with our emotions, we often get stuck in that tunnel. We get stuck in that emotion and it increases the amount of stress and anxiety that we're feeling. So allowing ourselves to stay in that affective place of not, and the way that I refer to it is when we have some sort of an experience of an emotion, especially a negative emotion, we tend to jump tracks over to, to this more cognitive place. We do this with our kids all the time too. We, we want to fix our feelings. We think of, think of emotions as some sort of problem to solve. And we jump tracks, jump track, and it often causes us to get kind of stuck in that emotion. So when we notice that we're doing that, we're trying to fix feelings, our kids' feelings, our feelings, or problem solve, um, or we're at odds with how, how we feel about our experience, to mindfully jump back to that affective place and allow ourselves to notice, what, notice our experience of stress in our body. Sometimes just mindfully noticing what's happening in your, in your body allows that, that feeling to kind of dissipate, just doing that. Now, it's also the case that like, it doesn't just go away. And so instead of thinking of it as a problem to solve, if we are able to mindfully be in the moment with what we're experiencing, what we're feeling as we're feeling it, what we're thinking as we're thinking it, which is mindfulness, and notice, notice what's happening, it yields some pretty important information. Oftentimes it's telling of, you know, some sort of need and we can nurture that need, which is very different than trying to solve some sort of problem or figure something out or understand why we're feeling this way. We like, we very quickly like to question like, well, why am I experiencing this anxiety? What happened? What is this anxiety about? Instead of checking in with ourselves, noticing where we're feeling that with our in our body and noticing that feeling as we're feeling it. Um, does that, any, any questions about that? I don't have a question. I just noticed when you're saying that, I think, um, <clears throat> you said something about kind of overreacting, being the bigger child sometimes with our own kids. And to me, it almost feels like with, with my own anxiety, it's one of two responses to my child's anxiety. So if Briggs is really struggling, I'm either creating space for him and I'm saying things like, okay, well, what are you feeling in your body? Or how's that feeling for you right now? Or try to help him identify that emotion and really kind of walk him through that and allow him, even though I do not do that for myself. Or I'm already at a point where I'm either maxed out or I'm in the middle of doing something. And so I'm either sensory overloaded or anxious overload. And that's, of course, when he has 25 things he needs or has to say or wants to scream or have a meltdown. And then I'm the bigger child. And so I'm very dismissive of his feelings or I'm, you know, whatever. So, like, I appreciate you talking about kind of both ends of that spectrum because mm -hmm. I for sure see that in my own anxiety and how it presents as well as how it does in my child. And so 
I just think that's really important for us. Like we can kind of throw these um, therapeutic terms around like mindfulness, but in our house, you know, I always talk about how vocabulary is really important. We're intentional with our words and we don't say be careful. We say be mindful. And mm -hmm. I think that's important for our kids to start being aware and cognizant of their body parts, because I don't know about you, but my kid is like a daggone bull in a China shop all the time. He just doesn't know where his parts are. And um, so it's important in kind of giving them some responsibility over their physical presence, as well as what kind of emotions, how those feel in their body. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I'm glad that you said it like that, because I think that's important for us as moms to realize that what we see in our extreme kiddos or neurotypical kiddos, a lot of times we're feeling those same things. And so how are we responding differently to our kids than how we do to ourselves? Cause that can be kind of telling to what we're dealing with too. Yeah. I mean, I think that's true. And, you know, we do that with relationships in general, but we, we project our experience, even if it's our experience of our kid or our partner, or whatever we pro project that onto the relationship. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to be present in the moment with our kids or with our partner because we're having a vicarious experience of anxiety based on what, you know, what they're, what they're dealing with. And I like what you were saying too about word choice and being mindful of the language that we use with our kids because you know, saying things like typically when we, when our kids are experiencing some sort of emotion, we're anxious about it, right? Like we want to fix it. We want to move very quickly to problem solving. We often say things like, what's wrong? What's mm -hmm. the problem? In, instead of validating that feeling, we yep. want to fix it. Yeah. Um, and I think in, and we've talked a lot about just being in a relationship and having an extreme kid and something that drives my husband crazy. And we've talked about it on, in this group before is it doesn't matter if my kid cries, like he has broken his foot off his body, just clean off. And all he did was like barely stub his toe. I will say something like, I'm so sorry that happened. That must've really hurt you. And Spence will look at me like I have three heads. He's like, are you freaking kidding me? Like what in the heck? But truly, sometimes it's just about like recognizing that, man, that stinks that that happened. And then we can keep it rolling. But if not, it's going to be like a threat level midnight situation. And I think for us as adults, um, and for a variety of reasons, I'm sure, many times when we are, when our, our kids are in big emotions and you're saying, yeah, we go to this problem solving place you know, I, like I said, I'm either creating space for him to really be in it and feel it and talk about it and move forward from it in a positive way. Or I'm like, did that even make sense? Like, please explain to me how you did not. I mean, and that's exactly how I sound because I'm super not sarcastic. <laughs> I'm like, please explain to me how you thought for one second that shooting a Nerf dart at your sister's eyeball was a great plan, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm mad. It's in the heat of what's ever just gone on. And it's like, you know, and so it, of course it doesn't ever help to match their chaos with ours, but mm -hmm. sometimes it feels unavoidable because it's all we do all day. It's just consistent. Mm -hmm. The only consistent thing is, is chaos. Mm -hmm. So, well, and one of the, one of the things too, I think that shows up, um, especially in seasons of burnout, burnout is instead of expecting less, from our kids and from ourselves as parents, we push it into overdrive yeah. and we start expecting perfection. Yep. You know, and it's part of that striving mentality. And I always say to folks, I always say, all right, what, what, what's at stake here? What is this about? You know, um, what's that underlying belief that's running the show here, that anxiety or insecurity that's on, that's on the table. Um, something that you've said before in this group and Dr. Browning said it last week. And I just try to keep telling myself this all the time now, because it, it is not my spiritual gift is it's okay to be good enough. Mm -hmm. and, and like, what does good enough look like? Like define it for you. 
So if I lose my absolute SH on my kids 14 mm -hmm. times today, is that good enough? Like, is that okay? Are they going to not need extensive therapy as adults? They probably will already, but like, what, what does good enough really look like? Because to be honest at this point, like we can all make memes and joke and laugh about survival mode and burnout, but this is real. Like this is my actual everyday life. And uh, I know people in this group have, like, I posted about it on Monday, and I have, there's, like, 20,000 comments, and several of them are telling me how just, like, I'm literally, like, the worst person in the universe, and I'm a terrible mom, and all these things, and it's, like, I've had to be, like, like, walk away, because um, it's, mm -hmm. those are the times, like you're saying, that I go into perfection mode, and I'm, like, I wasn't making that number up. There are literally over 20,000 comments, not shares, not re like comments, people that took the time to wrote, write something on there. And there's this handful of people that tell me that I should have never had kids and I'm, you know, my kids, I'm ruining their lives and all these things. And, but those are the ones that I'm like, oh my gosh, I should never write again. I am the worst person. Why did I ever start this? I'm like terrible and all these things. And I hear my kids doing that. I hear my son being like, I'm just an idiot. I'm just stupid. And I'm like, holy, wow. Mm -hmm. And that's when it becomes very realistic to me of, you know, he, he gets in those same kind of cycles. And it's like, and I, I, that I'm familiar with that book and that podcast was phenomenal. And it really does. It's like, okay, I'm stuck in the tunnel right now. Like mm -hmm. if I do not get myself out of here, Mm -hmm. There are going to be a whole lot of re repercussions for myself and others. So I'm so grateful that you brought that up because I think that's really real right now for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. So what would, what, talk to me about some kind of like practical, and I know you posted a lot of stuff because I was looking through it earlier. I'm so grateful for that. Um, what is something that we can do? You, you're a mom, you're a working mom, you're a busy mom. What is something we can do to just, if we're in a, time of like holy crap overwhelm what can we do that is practical that i can actually put into practice uh, to pr start to put that mindfulness piece in there well i think just having a sense about what you need and doing that thing yeah. <laughs> is kind of where it's at and it reminded me about like when you, when we think about that idea of being good enough, you know, part of that has, has to do with being real about, all right, what's, what's happening in Sid right now, being realistic about what I can expect for myself and being realistic about what my needs are and honoring those things. My good enough and, and part of, I've said this before, I think in a, in a talk, part of me being good enough is I will always have somebody to clean my house and do laundry because I can't like, <laughs> if I'm working and doing all the things like that's part of what makes me good enough is resourcing myself in that sort of way for other people that might be, um, you know, meal planning or having, having, I, I'm not saying that meal planning is like having a therapist, but I'm saying like no, I get equipping that. yourself with the things that you need and not feeling bad about it. Yeah. It's taken a while for me to accept the fact that like, I'm not going to be able to always do all the things and keep my house clean and all that. It's just, it's just, it takes twice as much work as it, as it does for somebody that's super organized. Um, I want to play. I don't want to clean, <laughs> you know? So, um, I mean, I, some people can't play until they clean and I get that this chick ain't that, that ain't me, you know, it like, um, so I think it's kind of that to that own self be true kind of thing. And, you know, one of the things I think people need to understand about self-care is if I just go work out one time, it's not really self-care. It's actually a stressor. <laughs> like it's actually going to be a stress for my body. Self-care is not a luxury sort of thing. And it's not a, 
you know, one off one time kind of thing. It can, it can include that depending on what it is, but the real, the, the most important thing about self care is that we create rituals that honor what we need, um, both in a reactive responsive sort of way. Um, but also in a maintenance proactive way. You know, I use the metaphor um, of a car. You know, you can spend, and I don't know anything about cars, but it's all I got. Um, you know, you can use, you can spend $50 getting an oil change, or you can keep your gas tank full or relatively full, or you can run out of gas or be running on, on fumes and that causes issues with your car, or you can you know, not do the maintenance thing and not get your oil change. And then you've got a whole big expensive problem to deal with and you're trying to do damage control and then you're in, you know, and then you're thinking about repairs and that causes a lot more issue. And then it's, then it's, it's actually a lot harder at that point to try to um, address those needs. And it takes, and burnout even looks a lot different at that point. Fatigue, ex exhaustion, it usually means sickness. Like you're usually out for the count for a bit. Yeah. So I think having that mindset of, okay, and, well, and, and typically too, in times of high stress or when we have more stuff going on or more expectations, we let go of self-care. We let go of those rituals. When we're yeah, I would busy... Have yeah. I was going to say, I think as, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, I see Rebecca in here and of course, Audrey, it feels like, like self-care is a joke to me. I know how important it is. I know how yep. serious it is and I'm not excusing that at all. Mm -hmm. But for me to find the time and the money and to not feel guilty about it, even once, much less on a regular basis mm -hmm. is like, that would be some, that's the mystical unicorn of motherhood and I have not found it yet. And mm -hmm. so... I'm not disagreeing with that, but I think that I chronically operate out of absolute mm -hmm. desperation mode. Like I am toast by 7 a.m. because my mm -hmm. kids are up four times a night and on top of my body in my bed any mm -hmm. other time. And then by 5.03 a.m., they are ready for the whole day and they're arguing by 5.08. And so I'm done by seven o'clock. And then you want me to teach them? Are you freaking kidding me? Like, <laughs> and so for me, yeah. really... The, I, 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 I'm trying, I accept mm -hmm. and I understand that I need that. It is difficult. Um, and I think we see that with, with spouses too. Like I think um, Sydney yeah. has mentioned this before, like not always, but in general men, it's just more natural for them to kind of give themselves the grace and the space to do something that's for them. And they mm -hmm. don't have the guilt that we seem to beat ourselves down with. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the science behind that, but I mm -hmm. see it as true in my household. Mm -hmm. um and it's so like they get it but yeah. like there's yeah. well and yeah there's you know something about that and I think I think for a lot of women and I think for extreme parents I see it happening so often that self-care ends up becoming this thing where you know you end up like laying on the couch for two days because you're sick and spent and done and exhausted or you think about like, I can only, I, I've got to go away for a week vacation or a, a you know, um, a weekend tri trip trip mm -hmm. or self care ends up being this one off chunk of something. And I think sort of a different way to think about that is, you know, for extreme parents and for all of us, not only creating those rituals, but letting those rituals equate a minute or a dollar. Like I got a dollar or a minute. What is, what does self-care look like? Because there are lots of minutes in a day. Um, th there's some mindfulness activities that I posted that I think are like one minute, two minute activities. And again, in the presence of chronic or acute stressors, being able to come in and out of that stress response cycle in different ways. Yeah. And mindfulness is one of those things that is incredibly helpful, but it's an art and it requires practice yeah. and it's a mastery experience. 
Yeah. Um, and it kind of goes against the grain of what we've been conditioned, how we've been conditioned to respond to ourselves. For sure. Yeah. I will say, um, and I, I adore my husband. He's wonderful. Although sometimes I want to throw him out the window. Um, but lately, because I have been so absolutely on not even E, whatever's below that, that's what I've been on. And so I have really just said, because he's able to like turn it off, like he has, he's deaf in one ear because of a climbing accident. So he has like a Bluetooth um, beanie and he puts it on his one good ear and he legit cannot hear my, ch they could be killing each other. He has no idea. And so he'll be like, all right, let's go outside and play go-karts. And he'll be out there with them. Cause I will say, and, and like I posted today, I took a picture of my boots. I went on campus, which is like a mile from my house and literally just walked because it was sunny out and I thought I was gonna murder someone. And I was just feeling stabby and that's what I needed to do. And a lot of times for me, it will be taking the 20 minute drive from my driveway to Starbucks and getting my iced coffee, listening to my murder audiobook all the way there and back because no one's talking to me. And so what I've had to do, and this is, I'm not saying this is right for everybody, but like it's my kids usually act better for my husband when I'm not there. And I'm not stressed out about how he's handling my kids. And I know that I'm not just the only one in this group because we've talked about it a lot, that it is stressful when your parenting techniques are different. And it's a whole other thing that causes anxiety. So sometimes it's just about leaving. And it doesn't have to be for a long time. It can just be like, all right, today I said, I'm, I'm going to go get Starbucks. I'm going to take a walk. I'll be back. And yeah. my daughter was like, mom, can I come? Can I? Nope. Nope. I'm off duty. Like, if you see me, like, put on some sunglasses because I'm not here. And my kids have now said, like, are you available? Because I'm like, mommy's not available. Sorry, like, mommy's doing work. I'm not available. And mm -hmm. because, you know, they will obviously walk past my husband who's on his phone watching motorcycle videos straight to me and five rooms away because they need their gummies open, clearly. And I think that's true of so many of us. And it's like, if I see one more pack of gummies, I'm going to elbow drop you right here in the living room. And so I think it's about whatever it is, even if you're in survival mode which a lot of people are that, and that's all you have. I love that minutes to dollars. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. And, um, <laughs> I lost my, I lost my thought. I was paying so much attention to what, Listen, what you were saying. I see it. When you do this, I watch it. It's like, I watch it, leave your brain. Yeah. <laughs> back, yeah. Back. I, it's, it's, it's back now. I love the quote that says something like, you can reset, refocus, restart as many times as you need to. And that's, that's kind of my favorite way of thinking about mindfulness yeah, also good. as an art that it might be a hundred times a day that we have some sort of thought or feeling and we get carried away by, it. you know, we react blindly to yeah. it and it causes lots of more anxiety. But when we notice that happening, um, in our body, in our brain, when we notice that to mindfully be able to push the reset button and to return to a place of calm, paying attention to what's going on in my body, paying attention to what information that's given me, what I might need, you know, what nurturing that need may look like. Yeah. Um, and zoom is telling me I have three minutes or I have to pay them, but, um, Y'all know this happens every time, but, uh, I was going to say too, I'm, I am the cleaning mom. Like I do not. And that gives me anxiety. Like if stuff isn't where it's supposed to be, I freak out. I can't go to sleep. Like, um, but the other day and my kids know this, they know, like, I hate glitter. I hate Play-Doh. Like, ain't none of that. It will not pass through the threshold. No, ma'am. And so I gave them, I had some, our son is gluten-free. I found some like gluten-free flour that I had let expire. There's like two bags of it. I said, y'all go, it was happening to be a sunny day. Y'all go outside because I needed them away from me. Y'all go outside, build a castle out of flour, build, throw it at each other. I don't care. But like go in the yard. And, and they thought that was like the coolest, best thing ever. And I set a little timer. You don't come in and ask me questions until this timer goes off. And they weren't going to die. Our yard is safe. There's 13 acres. They're, they're fine. But like sometimes it is that little bit, of, you yep. know, and, and then, you know, I was winning some major points there because they thought I was mm -hmm. cool. And I was like, I can hose you off out here and nobody's mad. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
look at the links that Sid posted on the one that has the picture in the link for tonight. I'll, I'll post that as an announcement. She, there were eight comments in there and they all were different links to mindfulness activities to the podcast. If you don't watch Brene Brown or listen to Brene Brown's podcast, you're blowing it. Um, it's almost every time I'm like, oh, get out of my head, lady. Um, but uh, Sydney, thank you so much for taking your, I know you're a grandma, so you're usually in bed like bef way before now. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for staying up late <laughs> to hang out with us. And I hope you guys have a really good week. And whatever you do, do not go look at those 20,000 comments on that post because you will probably throw your laptop. Don't do it. Audrey, Sydney told me the other day, she said, listen, lady, I think it's time for you to stop reading the comments. <laughs> nor do they know you, nor do they know you. It, it's a good and thing that's they're not why I always because... say, what's this about? Because they I, don't know you. I need bail money. That's what I was about to say. Like, if I see you in the grocery <laughs> store, it is on. All right, you guys, you're awesome. Practice mindfulness. Go check out those links. And if you have questions directly for Sid, DM me and I'll get you guys connected or I'll shoot you her email. So thanks so much. Have a good week.